Right, okay, so um, good morning Venka. So Venka mm -hmm. is um, a specialist in trauma and PTSD mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that, that we've, we've asked Venka to come on is, is kind of to unpick and add some clarity to all of the, um, the terms that we throw around around stress and, and depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and to look at sort of um, the things that we can do in order to help ourselves so um good morning Renka. good morning so can we can we start with that can we start with the terms that get thrown around like stress and anxiety and try and sort of quantify what what those things are for yeah, so i will keep it in the context of bullying in in the, in, in the workplace now i've done some um academic research and there are quite a few um interesting reports um i've got one and i will actually send you the link so actually people can read on it it's a scientific study okay. now there is clear com, clear correlation or association between workplace bullying and pdsd and trauma right. however i haven't been able to find studies that clearly define bullying in the educational workplace yeah. because I think it's probably too small a research study it's niche yeah it's very niche yeah. but there is a clear and also interestingly there is a clear association or correlation because the jury has not we can prove mm -hmm. between bullying at school but that's between children and trauma and PTSD in both there is clearly a correlation between the two right now what i see is mostly in my work is anxiety and depression as a result of trauma which is very different okay so symptoms of rather than symptoms of trauma which is not the same which yeah. is why if you get um treatment for anxiety or depression most likely you will find that it will not work because it has not addressed the root cause, which is the trauma. Uh, now, okay. post-traumatic stress disorder is the result of a traumatic incident. However, in my opinion, because this goes on, workplace bullying is most, most likely to be going on for a longer period of time, characterized by a feeling of being overwhelmed utterly overwhelmed and helpless because that's not it's not like a car accident it is mostly it's perpetrated by a person you know and you have an interpersonal relationship with two i would class that as complex trauma or cpdsd which is trickier to treat ah. but it is possible okay but but there's a difference. Mm. Like if people say, but I've recovered from a, a car accident. Yes, that was a single incident. Yeah. And most likely that didn't alter your perception about yourself. Mm. Which in my professional opinion is mostly likely to occur as a result of complex trauma, which makes sense because it's basically almost like a personal attack yes it's directed towards you as a person yeah rather than something that's not you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time it was just a coincidence so how do you know you've got trauma um emotional flashbacks you're triggered and you feel an emotion but you don't know why most likely fear or intense rage that's, that's... irrational rage so if i give you an example sure. um i was i was driving to um an office where where i now do some or prior to lockdown do some freelance work and i and it wasn't far from home um and i was only driving because it was peeing it down i normally walk um and as i was driving i saw the back of a woman and she was wearing the dress that the person who who was the architect of my downfall mm. it was the exact same dress 
and she was a very similar height and very similar hair and I just saw her from the back while I was driving I just I just felt it like Ugh! and felt sick and and I was I was very nearly there so I pulled over and just kind of had to go it wasn't her and you it felt wasn't... it in your body didn't you yeah where did you feel it in your body kind of um it, it was it was here and here it was yeah. just like it just came from nowhere that's an emotional flashback they're very very intense and overwhelming and very irrational mm. they're very scary too because you can't understand it mm. yeah but and for it to happen while i was driving is like, because it was a complete overwhelm it was a shutdown yeah and i had to pull over yeah and and that and, I, and at that point, this wasn't too long ago, at that point in my head, um, I felt like I was much further on. And I, I mean, anything triggered me at the time, mm. but I felt I was much further on. So that, that then came with another kind of wave of, of, of emotional processing of, whoa, where did that come from? I thought you were further on than this. Mm which then made me feel guilty that I had that. So it, it was complex. It's almost like an emotional spiral, I call it. Yeah. And it's, it's going downwards. And if you're not, if you don't have the tools to stop them, they can spiral out of control really quickly and can be quite scary because yeah. you know it's happening, but you're in it. So it's very hard to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. But your your thinking brain your prefrontal cortex the logic part of the brain that's already checked out that's gone offline that's yeah and now you're in your limbic we call it mammalian brain it's your emotional center that's completely taken over and it's most likely triggered your fight and flight or fawn response yeah which can be quite scary too because you're full can't. of adrenaline and, and off we go. Off you go. Adrenaline, cortisol. You may also, um, other symptoms of trauma, it's uh, gut issues, uh, immune deficiency issues, okay. eczema, sleep difficulties, oh my feeling Lord. irrational. You're describing me. <laughs> feeling very irritable, like anything can trigger you. Yeah. Like, the top is of the toothpaste and you will, will you will just be really upset about it mm -hmm. um i would say those are the main s symptoms okay okay and so if somebody if somebody finds themselves so i i've i've been being coached i i i talk to people it's one of the things that that i've always well, no, that's not true. In the last 18 months, I've started talking to people again mm -hmm. and, and I don't bottle up, but for a period of time, um, I did kind of, it, it all went inside. I didn't, and I didn't even talk to the people closest to me, my mum and my husband, and um, because, because it all felt a bit too petty when you when I articulated some of the behaviors that were happening to me when you put them all together mm -hmm. it was massive and it was sustained um but but I kind of felt this this is shame the right word that I, it, it must be me I must be doing something mm -hmm. so um I I'm on the other I am on the other side of that now and I and I do have moments where um, where something will trigger, but I am aware of it and, mm. and I know what to do with mm. myself. But what, what advice would you give to somebody if, if, if they're finding that they are going postal over, over the top being off the toothpaste, if they're finding that they're being highly irrational or the rage is coming from nowhere and that's, that isn't them, what advice would you give to them? What, what steps can they okay, take? It depends. Are you still in the situation or not? Okay. Um, I, I know it's really easy to say, remove yourself from the situation. It's easier said than done because people have mortgages to pay. They've got kids to feed, you know, mm -hmm. um, I would say seek professional help 
now nip it in the bud uh -huh. because the the earlier you can get help yeah the less likely it is that you will spiral down because the, the thing with the brain is um teaching you know learning is by repetition uh -huh. the more you you basically keep triggering yourself the the stronger the neural pathways become yeah. and the more entrenched it is so the earlier you can get help the better it is. I will give you an example. I had a lady who I treated for bullying in the workplace. And um, I used clinical hypnotherapy. It wasn't bullying, but it was bullying, but it wasn't that. It was more like he would dismiss her. Uh -huh. And she would get really angry about it. And then she couldn't speak because when she was angry about it, it stopped her voice. So I hypnotized her to think of him as something really pathetic. We made it sound like Benny Hill with really silly music. Uh -huh. So instead of feeling him like threatening or intimidating, she just now saw him as silly. Uh -huh. Because silly is a funny word. Yeah. It's not like, you know. So the rage, she would not allow to feel it in her whole body. She could only feel it in a little pinky. Oh. She, she could feel it, but only in the tip of a little finger. And yeah. it may be in the glowy, but that was it. And because I gave her the tools to take her power back, mm -hmm. that would stop it. Because now she didn't see him as absolutely overbearing and insignificant. She could deal with it. And because she nipped it in the bud quickly, and we re worked on her self-esteem and what she would do, and also we would visualize what she would do instead. And because she already practiced it in her brain, it, much, it becomes much easier to carry it out in reality. Mm. So, because that's how the brain works. So, how, so nipping it in the bud is, is the ideal, but I, I think I, I use this analogy with you. It's my favorite analogy, the idea of the frog that's boiled. Yes. Um, and I, I what happens if you're the boiling frog and you don't realize until almost the end game that, that you are the boiling frog okay um what i see what i've seen i've got a 13 year old what i've seen in education is quite scary if you're trained to spot the signs um <laughs> There are a lot of narcissistic and sociopathic tendencies in head teachers and upper management. I'm not saying that scientifically, but in my experience, it is. Yeah. What I would suggest is most likely you're being gaslighted. It is not that bad. It's you. You're imagining it. Uh -huh. So to keep your sanity, keep a diary, which may came, came on handy very late often. Uh -huh. Keep it factual. Don't put your emotions more like, this is what happened, it made me feel this. Don't spend too much time on it. Just one or two lines, that's enough. With the days and the times. So you can keep a timeline of your reality. Uh -huh. you keep being, yeah, you're keeping in touch with reality. Uh -huh. It also makes you, keeps you a clearer overview of what, what's exactly happening. Don't keep still, don't internalize it. Uh -huh. um, Speak to a tr not a trusted colleague, maybe not in the same organization, but maybe somebody who you've studied with. Yeah. Can offer it. Um, if you really f feel you cannot cope with it, ask for a sick note. Mm. Take a time out. I know that's really drastic, mm. but I've seen it before. Mm. Take that time. Two or three weeks in your career is not going to do a lot of damage. It is inconvenient. But take the time, take a time out. And then it will most likely give you clarity. Also, seek professional help from a therapist. Mm -hmm. If you can't get it on the NHS, which is most likely not, mm -hmm. because the way you don't have time to wait. Mm -hmm. you, I have to stress that you do not have the time to wait. You okay. can't absolutely seek it privately. Mm -hmm. But most likely what you can do is Keep it a, a diary. Mm. Speak about it with somebody you trust. Mm -hmm. Do some research about 
what's happening because I'm sure there are quite a few resources out there for teachers. Yeah. Um, what else could you do? Um, self care, which is, um, it's got something called like tapping or emotional freedom technique to get your, the intensity of your emotions down really quickly. Okay. Um, yoga sounds really uh, new agey, but it really, really works to get you back into your body. Right, okay. Uh, playing theta mu wave music because it alters your brain waves. Um, those are the most majority generic advice I can give. Yeah, I think I think that the thing about um, taking the time, yeah, um, and and I wish I'd done that earlier actually. But it, it, when I when I got to crisis point, it was aside from contacting unions and doing practical things like that because I knew I needed the the professional advice. But yeah. um, it was actually the the first thing that my son, bless him, he was nine. 19 at the time it was like you are going to the doctor you know and if you won't go I'm going to take you to the doctor and you you're not going back um and and that that kind of I think I had I would say in the first few days of my sick note I was just numb I yeah. just sat on the sofa I think covered in crisps and chocolate and and tea and, and binge watch the telly and I don't think I was uh, I was aware of anything really that that was that was going on but then a few days later there was there was kind of I don't know without wishing to sound twee kind of like the mist clearing a little bit and an, and a bit of oh okay this isn't me um and and that that was that was the first step of of kind of going okay yeah this is horrible and and i know it's going to be with me for a long time i'm i'm but i can do this i can get past this because actually it was that self worth thing and this goes all the way back to what you what you started with with that kind of gaslighting and chipping away at it over a long period of time i'd lost who i was Mm. I was this my brother said it to me the other day you were cool and then you weren't cool and and um I'd I'd lost this sort of joyful person who would would laugh with people on the corridors and and would sit in the staff room and have a have a chat regardless of whether you know whether they were in my senior team or whether they were elsewhere there was no for me there was there was never any hierarchy from my point of view mm -hmm. and all of that went but I only realized it when I stepped back and went ah okay yeah that happened a while ago and that I, I, I became something other than than the me that I actually am. But that, that's a very um, common stress response to shutting down and I, can I add to it that connection with people who love and care for you is very, very important mm. because that can basically bounce, help you bounce back really mm. quickly. Mm. If you need to go and see old friends who knew the old you and who have the capacity and the patience to cajole you back, which doesn't have to take weeks, it no. can take just months. Who can just hold your hand or let you cry or just make your favorite sandwich mm. or whatever seek connection mm -hmm. with people who love and support you and do you do you think do you think intrinsically so much of what you're saying is resonating with me one of the first things that i did was was when i felt physically able to do it sort of two or three weeks in i got in the car and went down and stayed with my brother and his wife and their two kids because that is an environment that just um it's crazy and um i laugh a lot and he cooks amazing food and mm -hmm. and i just get looked after and and i spent a lot of time down there yeah. but i would say as well that i did actually um through the wonders of of messenger and text and 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 the good old-fashioned phone i did reconnect with a lot of people that were still in my lives but not quite as predominantly 
Hmm. And and that kind of happened organically. And is that something that that intrinsically your your brain will say, reach out, find people who know you, or is was that a conscious action that I didn't even? No, I think I you did that instinctively. Oh. What probably happened? You started shutting down, oh. and then some people just withdraw completely, oh. and instead of connecting, they start rejecting. Right. Not consciously, but mm. subconsciously, because it's like a wounded animal and it just wants to crawl away and either die or recuperate. But connection and nurturing, I cannot emphasize enough how important that really is, because we humans are designed to connect. Human connection is so important. And that... I know this sounds really a new age, but unconditional love is so important to basically pull you back from the depths of sometimes despair. I think that's really what people feel, utter despair or none worth. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's not new agey. It, it's, it's who we are, isn't it? And no, it is. Biologically, that's yeah. who we are. And, and I, I think this is one of the things that's, that's so important to me in, in terms of, of what we're doing in the group is actually normalizing these these conversations, talking about love and trust and openness and, and connection because I just, I don't know, it, it feels like a bit of a cliche, but I, I do feel that people aren't as, close to each other as they used to be take away COVID-19 but I, yeah. I think there has been a real shift in terms of in the last few years about people going out and sitting and talking to each other face to face and um, just those those natural things that I remember as a child and a young adult with with the people around me they don't seem to be as normal these days and and I think that's maybe why it feels easier to feel isolated if if you like does that make sense that no I, I think so because when I remember from my from my grandmother I mean this I wasn't born in the Netherlands but she used to go for tea or coffee with friends an awful lot uh, like four o'clock it was uh, like tea time with a biscuit uh -huh. I don't think we really do that anymore uh -huh. And we don't drop into each other's houses, do we? No, we don't. But we also don't go, like, I'm not a religious person, but a lot of people used to go to church and they used to sing together. And yeah. singing together is connection. Yes. So we we are missing out on that. Mm. Uh, so there is a need to find your tribe then and, and connect with them. and. Yes, but don't get sucked into a group that really feels... has like a victim role because yeah. I see that very often too and yeah. it feels really nice because you feel connected yeah. however you are basically giving yourself an identity of a victim right. yes you are absolutely a victim I'm actually not disputing that if you're being bullied you are a victim uh -huh. but do not let yourself identify and determine yourself as a whole as a victim because you are you who is being the victim but you're not the victim is the, the whole of your identity. Yes. Don't let it become you. Yes. Yeah, I completely get that. And, and again, coming back to the, the group, that's what we absolutely want it not to be. Yes. It's come in, sound off. Yeah. Share your stories. Realise that other people are in the same... You're not alone. Thing, so you're not alone. But... Here's some stories of people who've, who've made it and, and have gone on to flourish. And here's some advice from professionals about the different things that you can do to get you back on the path that's right for you. And we definitely don't want it to be um, that kind of self-fulfilling, um, keep yourself in the same, yes, same mind. Yes, take action because that, that is the reality. You have to go and do something about it. Yeah. I think I think that's a perfect um, point to end on that that take action and and do something about it. Yeah, I think that's going to be the catchphrase.
do something about it. Um, thank you so much. You've actually, I, I don't think validation is the right word, but you've actually, as you were talking, I, I was thinking, oh, yeah, okay, I recognize that now. And I, you know, so it's just, it has made me realize that I'm in a much stronger place than I was um, 18 months ago. Um, but it also, it's kind of validated that it, it wasn't me. No, it isn't. And also change can be funny. Change can be immediate. It can be accumulative. Mm. It can also be retroactive. Like you didn't even notice you had made changes, mm. but after they've happened a while after you've actually, you actually noticed it. Yeah. Yeah. The minds are a really interesting thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is. But also don't let, don't let it affect you that it defines the essence of you. Uh -huh. Because a lot of people, it really sub damages their self-esteem and self-worth. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And that's really sad. That's very, very sad. And it's hard, it's hard, isn't it? When you, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons. I'm, I'm naturally a very creative person. Um, and again, looking back, I'd had years where I, for eight years, I did a daily online photo journal. I took a photo a day. I wrote about my day. It's, it's a complete chunk of my history. It's documented my son growing up and all sorts of things. And when I look back, I, I kind of dropped off doing it. It didn't stop completely, but that consistency of one a day, taking my camera out and actually going and taking a photo and actively writing. I used to paint. I used to do all sorts of things and I can I can actually track back to when it started dropping off and where my creativity started kind of just drying up um, and it's around about the time where the the work related stress started and, and started eating in so I've been working with a coach specifically on getting back to kind of enemy where's where's my heart at and, and where's my creativity and how do I get that back to the to the surface and and that's massively helped me actually uh, creativity creative skills are very very important for the healing process it doesn't matter if you're brilliant at drawing as long as you enjoy it yeah. and it doesn't have to be it can be music it can be cooking or baking can be very creative. Yeah. It doesn't have to be something that you automatically think of as very creative. Mm. It's only for you, but it's really important to get you back to the right brain. Yeah. Yeah. Get that. Get that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I